Krishna, my friends. Welcome to Bhaktiville. Yay! It's Friday night. More nectar of devotion. Fabulous. So with me tonight are Bhakti Minulis, our tech wizard, and Bhakti Grace is here also. And we expect gajillions more coming in any moment. And welcome to our friends who are listening to us streaming or listening to us on video later on. Thank you for coming. All right. <laughs> Grease has been promoted. Yes, he's been promoted to Bhakti Grease. Yay! Um, so, tonight we are reading at our Panchatattva temple that Kandita created. It's so beautiful here. It's a very auspicious place and apropos to continue our reading of the Nectar of Devotion. Srila Rupa Goswami was a follower of Lord Chaitanya who gave him this information that we're reading about bhakti. We read, we read about their meeting in our last book, um, The Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. So tonight in our reading, we are on page nine of the book or page 45 of the PDF. And that section that we're in is called Happiness in Krishna Consciousness. So let me offer some pranams and some auspicious words before we get started. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya I offer my respectful obeisances unto His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada was very dear to Lord Krishna, having taken shelter at his lotus feet. Our respectful obeisances are unto you, O spiritual master, servant of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami. You are kindly preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya Dev and delivering the Western countries which are filled with impersonalism and voidism. I also offer my respectful obeisances unto the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord. They are just like desire trees and can fulfill the desires of everyone. And they are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. Jai. All right. Here we go. Happiness in Krishna consciousness. Sri the Rupa Goswami has analyzed the different sources of happiness. He has divided happiness into three categories, which are one, Happiness derived from material enjoyment. Two, happiness derived by identifying oneself with the Supreme Brahman. And three, happiness derived from Krishna consciousness. So just a, a moment. Um, Bhakti Mimulus, could you message Kandita and let her know that we're up here? I left a sign in the temple room, but I think she may not see it. Thank you. All right, back to our book. In the Tantra Shastra, Lord Shiva speaks to his wife Sati in this way, quote, My dear wife, a person who has surrendered himself at the lotus feet of Govinda and who has thus developed pure Krishna consciousness can be very easily awarded all the perfections desired by the impersonalist. And beyond this, he can enjoy the happiness achieved by the pure devotees, end quote. Happiness derived from pure devotional service is the highest because it is eternal. But the happiness derived from material perfection or understanding oneself to be Brahman is inferior because it is temporary. There is no preventing one's falling down from material happiness. And there is even every chance of falling down from spiritual happiness derived out of identifying oneself with the impersonal Brahman. It has been seen that great Mayavadi impersonalist sannyasis, very highly educated and almost realized souls, may sometimes take to political activities or to social welfare activities. The reason is that they actually do not derive any ultimate transcendental happiness in the impersonal understanding and therefore must come down to the material platform and take to such mundane affairs. 
There are many instances, especially in India, where these Mayavadi sannyasis descend to the material platform again. But a person who is fully in Krishna consciousness will never return to any sort of material platform. However alluring and attracting they may be, he always knows that no material activities can be compared with the spiritual activity of Krishna consciousness. The mystic perfections achieved by actually successful yogis are eight in number. Anima Siddhi refers to the power by which one can become so small that he can enter into a stone. Modern scientific improvements also enable us to enter into stone because they provide for excavating so many subways, penetrating the hills, etc. So Anima Siddhi, the mystic perfection of trying to enter into stone, has also been achieved by material science. Similarly, all of the yoga siddhis, or perfections, are material arts. For example, in one yoga siddhi, there is development of the power to become so light that one can float in the air or on the water. That is always also being performed by modern scientists. They are flying in the air, they are floating on the surface of the water, and they are traveling under the water. After comparing all these mystic yoga siddhis to materialistic perfections, it is found that the materialistic scientists try for the same perfections. Welcome, Kandita. So actually, there is no difference between mystic perfection and materialistic perfection. A German scholar once said that the so-called yoga perfections have already been achieved by the modern scientists and so he was not concerned with them. He intelligently went to India to learn how he could understand his eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord by means of bhakti yoga or devotional service. Of course, in the categories of mystic perfection, there are certain processes which the material scientists have not yet been able to develop. For instance, a mystic yogi can enter into the sun planet simply by using the rays of the sunshine. This perfection is called lakima. Similarly, a yogi can touch the moon with his finger. Though the modern astronauts go to the moon with the help of spaceships, they undergo many difficulties, whereas a person with mystic perfection can just extend his hand and touch the moon with his finger. This siddhi is called prapti or acquisition. With this prapti siddhi, the perfect mystic yogi can not only touch the moon planet, but he can extend his hand anywhere and take whatever he likes. He may be sitting thousands of miles away from a certain place, and if he likes, he can take the fruit from a garden there. This is prapti siddhi. The modern scientists have manufactured nuclear weapons with which they can destroy an insignificant part of this planet. But by the yoga city known as Ishita, one can create and destroy an entire planet simply at will. Another perfection is called Vashita, and by this perfection, one can bring anyone under his control. This is a kind of hypnotism, which is almost irresistible. Sometimes it is found that a yogi who may have attained a little perfection in this Vashita mystic power comes out among the people and speaks all sorts of nonsense, controls their mind, exploits them, takes their money, and then goes away. There is another mystic perfection which is known as prakamya or magic. By this prakamya power, one can achieve anything he likes. For example, one can make water enter into his eye and then again come out from within the other eye. Simply by his will, he can perform such wonderful activities. The highest perfection of mystic power is called Kama Vasayayita. Kama Vasayita. 
This is also magic. But whereas the Prakamya power acts to create wonderful effects within the scope of nature, Kamavasayita permits one to contradict nature. In other words, to do the impossible. Of course, one can derive great amounts of temporary happiness by achieving such yogic materialistic perfections. There's one that, that he omitted, and it is the one that you can become lighter or heavier. Mahima, heavier than the heaviest. Mahima. So there are eight. All right, let me continue. Foolishly, people who are enamored of the glimmer of modern materialistic advancement are thinking that the Krishna consciousness movement is for le less intelligent men. I'm better off being busy with my material comforts, maintaining a nice apartment, family, and sex life. These people do not know that at any moment they can be kicked out of their material situation. Due to ignorance, they do not know that real life is eternal. The temporary comforts of the body are not the goal of life and it is due only to darkest ignorance that people become enamored of the glimmering advancement of material comforts. Bhakti Minulis says he's working on that one too, one of becoming heavy. <laughs> Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has therefore said that the advancement of material knowledge renders a person more foolish because it causes one to forget his real identification by its glimmer. This is doomed for him because this human form of life is meant for getting out of the material contamination. By the advancement of material knowledge, people are becoming more and more entangled in material existence. They have no hope of being liberated from this catastrophe. In the Hari Bhakti Sudodaya, it is stated that Prahlad Maharaj, great devotee of the Lord, prayed to Nishringadev, half lion, half man incarnation as follows. Quote, My dear Lord, I repeatedly pray unto your lotus feet that I may simply be stronger in devotional service. I simply pray that my Krishna consciousness may be more strong and steady because happiness derived out of Krishna consciousness and devotional service is so powerful that with it, one can have all the other perfections of religiousness, economic development, sense gratification, and even the attainment of liberation from material existence." End quote. I just want to point out right there, <clears throat> excuse me at this point, that those four things are called the Chatra Varga. They are the four goals of material life. And Often you'll see them quoted as Arta Kamadana Moksha. And Prabhupada trans translates them as um, economic development, sense gratification, religiousness, and the attainment of liberation. All right, let me continue. Actually, a pure devotee does not aspire after any of these perfections because the happiness derived from devotional service in Krishna consciousness, so transcendental and so unlimited that no other happiness can be compared with it. It is said that even one drop of happiness in Krishna consciousness stands beyond comparison with an ocean of happiness derived from any other activity. Thus, any person who has developed even a little quantity of pure devotional service can very easily kick out all the other kinds of happiness derived from religiousness, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation. So there's a little conversation going on here in chat. So Greece says, not all that glitters is gold. And then he says, I was happy yesterday, serving others last night and singing Hare Krishna. And Bhakti Mimulis says, Jai. Die. All right, let me continue here. There was a great devotee of Lord Chaitanya known as Kola Vecha Sridhar, 
was a very poor man. He was doing a small business selling cups made from the leaves of plantain trees, and his income was almost nothing. Still, he was spending 50% of his small income on the worship of the Ganges, and with the other 50% who was somehow living. But Chaitanya once revealed himself to this confidential devotee, Pulavecha Sridhar, and offered him any opulence that he liked. But Sridhar informed the Lord that he did not want any material opulence. He was quite happy in his present position and only wanted to gain unflinching faith and devotion under the lotus feet of Lord Chaitanya. That is the position of the pure devotees. If they can be engaged 24 hours each day in devotional service, they do not want anything else, not even the happiness of liberation or of becoming one with the Supreme. In the Narada Pancharatra, it is also said that any person who has developed even a small amount of devotional service doesn't care a fig for any kind of happiness derived from religiousness, economic development, sense gratification, or the five kinds of liberation. Any kind of happiness derived from religiousness, economic development, liberation, or sense gratification cannot even dare to enter into the heart of a pure devotee. It is stated that as the personal attendants and maidservants of a queen, follow the queen with all respect and obeisances. Similarly, the joys of religiousness, economic development, sense gratification and liberation, follow the devotional service of the Lord. In other words, a pure devotee does not lack any kind of happiness derived from any source. He does not want anything but service to Krishna. But even if he should have another desire, the Lord fulfills this without the devotees asking. Um, I just wanted to say, Bhakti's arms were stuck up in the air, but now they're okay. Now they're back down. <laughs> um, the five kinds of liberation that Srila Prabhupada mentions in this last paragraph are the status of living on the same planet as Vishnu, um, association with Vishnu, the same features, same bodily features as Vishnu, um, the same opulence as Vishnu, and the status of oneness with Vishnu, with the Lord. So devotees are not concerned about the four goals of material, uh, material life or those five kinds of liberation, only in serving Krishna. Rareness of pure devotional service. In the preliminary phase of spiritual life, there are different kinds of austerities, penances, and similar processes for attaining self-realization. However, even if an executor of these processes is without any material desire, he still cannot achieve devotional service. And aspiring by oneself alone to achieve devotional service is also not very hopeful because Krishna does not agree to award devotional service to merely anyone. Krishna can easily offer a person material happiness or even liberation, but he does not agree very easily to award a person engagement in his devotional service. Devotional service can in fact be attained only through the mercy of a pure devotee. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is said, quote, by the mercy of the spiritual master, who is a pure devotee, and by the mercy of Krishna, one can achieve the platform of devotional service. There is no other way." End quote. The rarity of devotional service is also confirmed in the Tantra Shastra, where Lord Shiva says to Sati, My dear Sati, if one is a very fine philosopher, analyzing the different processes of knowledge, he can achieve liberation from the material entanglement. By performance of the ritualistic sacrifices recommended in the Vedas, one can be elevated to the platform of pious activities 
and thereby enjoy the material comforts of life to the fullest extent. But all such endeavors can hardly offer anyone devotional service to the Lord, not even if one tries for it by such processes for many, many thousands of births." End quote. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is also confirmed by Prahlad Maharaj that merely by personal efforts or by the instructions of higher authorities, one cannot attain to the stage of devotional service. One must become blessed by the dust of the lotus feet of a pure devotee who is completely freed from the contamination of material desires. Indita says, uh, why is Krishna not very well willing to give devotional service? Well, we have to keep reading. We'll see if, if Prabhupada answers that question. Yeah, I've lost my place. Hmm. Okay. In the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, sixth canto, 18th verse, Narada also says to Yudhishthir, quote, my dear king, it is Lord Krishna, known as Mukunda, who is the eternal protector of the Pandavas and the Yadus. He is also your spiritual master and instructor in every respect. He is the only worshipable God for you. He is very dear and affectionate, and he is the director of all your activities, both individual and familial. And what's more, he sometimes carries out your orders as if he were your messenger. My dear King, how very fortunate you are, because for others, all these favors given to you by the Supreme Lord would not even be dreamt of." End quote. The purport to this verse is that the Lord easily offers liberation, but he rarely agrees to offer a soul devotional service because by devotional service, the Lord himself becomes purchased by the devotee. The happiness of becoming one with the Supreme. Srila Rupa Goswami says that if Brahmananda, or the happiness of becoming one with the Supreme, is multiplied by one trillion fold, still it cannot be compare, compared with an atomic fraction of the happiness derived from the ocean of devotional service. In the Hari Bhakti Suddhodaya, Lord Maharaj, while satisfying, satisfying Lord Nishringadev by his prayers, says, quote, My dear Lord of the universe, I am feeling transcendental pleasure in your presence and have become merged in the ocean of happiness. I now consider the happiness of Brahmananda to be no more than the water in the impression left by a cow's hoof in the earth compared to this ocean of bliss." Unquote. Similarly, it is confirmed in the Bhavarta Dipika, Srila Sridhar Swami's commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam, quote, My dear Lord, some of the fortunate persons who are swimming in the ocean of your nectar of devotion and who are relishing the nectar of the narration of your pastimes, certainly know ecstasies which immediately minimize the value of the happiness derived from religiousness, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation. Such a transcendental devotee regards any kind of happiness other than devotional service as no better than straw in the street. Attracting Krishna. Sri the Rupa Goswami has stated that devotional service attracts even Krishna. Krishna attracts everyone, but devotional service attracts Krishna. The symbol of devotional service in the highest degree is Radharani. Krishna is called Maladha Mohan, which means that he is so attractive that he can defeat the attraction of thousands of cupids. But Radharani is still more attractive, for she can even attract Krishna. Therefore, devotees call her Mandana Mohana Mohani, the attractor of the attractor of cupids. 
To perform devotional service means to follow in the footsteps of Radharani, and devotees in Vrindavan put themselves under the care of Radharani in order to achieve perfection in their devotional service. In other words, devotional service is not an activity of the material world. It is directly under the control of Radharani. In Bhagavad Gita, it is confirmed that the Mahatmas, or great souls, are under the protection of Daivi Prakriti, the internal energy of Radharani. So being directly under the control of the internal potency of Krishna, devotional service attracts even Krishna himself. This fact is corroborated by Krishna in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 12th chapter, first verse, where he says, quote, my dear Urva, you may know it from me that the attraction I feel for devotional service rendered by my devotees is not to be attained even by the performance of mystic yoga, philosophical speculation, ritualistic sacrifices, the study of Vedanta, the practice of severe austerities, or the giving of everything in charity. These are, of course, very nice activities, but they are not as attractive to me as the transcendental loving service rendered by my devotees." How Krishna becomes attracted by the devotional service of his devotees is described by Narada in the Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th canto, 10th chapter, 37th verse. There, Narada addresses King Yudhisthira, while the king is appreciating the glories of the character of Prahlad Maharaj. A devotee always appreciates the activities of other devotees. Yudhisthira Maharaj was appreciating the qualities of Prahlad, and that is one symptom of a pure devotee. A pure devotee never thinks himself as great. He always thinks that other devotees are greater than himself. The king was thinking, Lord Maharaj is actually a devotee of the Lord, while I am nothing. And while thinking this, he was addressed by Narada as follows, quote, My dear King Yudhisthira, in this world you, the Pandava brothers, are the only fortunate people. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has appeared on this planet and is presenting himself to you as an ordinary human being. He is always with you in all circumstances. He is living with you and covering himself from the eyes of others. Others cannot understand that he is the Supreme Lord, that he is still living with you as your cousin, as your friend, and even as your messenger. Therefore, you must know that nobody in this world is more fortunate than you. In the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna appeared in his universal form, Arjuna prayed, quote, My dear Krishna, I thought of you as my cousin brother, and so I have shown disrespect to you in so many ways, calling you Krishna or friend, that you are so great that I could not understand. End quote. So that was the position of the Pandavas. Although Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the greatest among all greats, still he remained with those royal brothers, being attracted by their devotion, by their friendship, and by their love. That is the proof of how great this process of devotional service is. It can attract even the Supreme Personality of Godhead. God is great, but devotional service is greater than God because it attracts him. People who are not in devotional service can never understand what great value there is in rendering service to the Lord. Jai. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Pandita, was your question answered? Oh, let me turn my sound on so I can hear you. Yes. Yes, it was. I'm sorry, my sound was turned off. Please repeat. Yes, my answer, my question was answered. Thank okay. you. Because he's giving himself. 
Krishna doesn't give devotional service so easily. Like, like he would like some material benefit or benediction because he becomes um, actually uh, governed by that devotee, by love. So it's not such a cheap thing at all. So, wonderful. Thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. So nice to see everyone. Okay. Yes, it is good to see everyone. And I thought it was nice also to read that Radharani is in charge of that. So, oh. her yes. praying to her for devotional service. She's the go to person for that. All right, my friends. Bye. Any other questions or discussion?